Hello, BookTube. Well, we're in the middle of October, and you know what that means. It means a lot of things, but it means that in only two weeks, it will be nonfiction November. Uh, Olive, at a book Olive created Nonfiction November years ago. It's an old standing uh, cultural event on BookTube to celebrate the reading of nonfiction, which tends to get a short shrift, both on BookTube and in the larger reading world, where people look on nonfiction, the reading of nonfiction, as tedious schoolwork that they're glad they got away from, <laughs> mainly because, in my contention, they're reading the wrong nonfiction. If you, if you consider nonfiction to be... Uh, boring and dusty, then you have read the wrong nonfiction. There's plenty out there that will thrill you, uh, I think, more than fiction will. And that's the goal of Nonfiction November, is to get you to read some nonfiction if you read none, and to get you to read a little more if you read some. And just today, uh, Olive, at a book Olive, I'll leave a link to her channel as if any of you don't know who she is, uh, uh, she made a video giving you her own TBR for Nonfiction November 2023, and also making some suggestions along the lines of the four prompts that she gives. Now, she wants to stress, and I'll stress as well, you do not need to do any of the prompts to do Nonfiction November. If you read a work of nonfiction in November, you have participated in Nonfiction November. Uh, it, of course, she spared no effort to have this thing spread out over all kinds of social media, so if you want the full Nonfiction November experience, you've, it's right there at your fingertips. You can definitely do it. And if you want a few challenges or a little more structure, she has come up with four prompts, uh, which she does every year. And they are enticingly vague, so, intentionally that way, so that you can build anything around them. This year, the prompts are Fraud, Web, Capital, and Display. And... Uh, since all of made she made a video full of recommendations for nonfiction, I thought I would do the same. Only for this, I'll do, probably do a couple of recommendation videos. And and just recently, I wasn't really thinking about nonfiction November, but just recently I did a video of 100 nonfiction recommendations. If I remember, if I'm a good little booktuber, I'll put a link to that down below. But uh, all of and I, I mean, in addition, in addition to both of us being sexy influencers, we're both book reviewers out in the normal world, not on Goodreads, but, you know, for editors, for pay. Uh, and uh, when I look at Nonfiction November, I automatically think about not just the nonfiction part, but the November part, <laughs> what nonfiction titles are coming out or being released in the American book market in November that you could maybe request at your library or that will be in your bookstore so that if you, if you feel like celebrating Nonfiction November by reading a new release that's out in November... Well, the authors would certainly thank you for, for patronizing them. Maybe that's the, the gist of the way that you want to do it. I'll have other recommendation videos, but I thought for today I would give you a list of recommendations from the nonfiction that's coming out in the month of November. And I want to point out before I start with my list that one such new release actually fulfills simultaneously all four prompts, fraud, web, capital, and display. Uh, so that if you are really crushed for time and you, you want to participate in NaNoWriMo and you'd like to hit the prompts, uh, but you just don't have time to load on books, maybe if that's the case, you could read this one book and get all four of those done. And that is this. It's Going Infinite by Michael Lewis. This is his new book about Sam Bankman-Fried and Bitcoin. And it fulfills all, all, all four of this year's prompts Multiple times over. Sam Bankman-Fried, of course, was a fraud. He was dealing in something he claimed was capital. It was actually just a scam, but nevertheless, he claimed that it was, and a lot of capital was spent on it. Uh, uh, it's entirely web-based. Obviously, his, his entire scam was, was web-based, or you could not possibly have done it without the existence of the World Wide Web. And, you know, in addition to... Uh, the splash that it made, which certainly counts for the display element, there's also the fact that your bookstore display space in November is going to be loaded with this book. Just loaded with it. This thing is guaranteed to be a New York Times bestseller. It will certainly be on the new release table of every retail bookstore in the country. Michael Lewis has built a lot of goodwill in his life, in his, in his writing career, by writing nonfiction books that get people reading nonfiction. Now, in my opinion, he squanders all of that goodwill with this book, which is a, a sycophantic fawning over a guy who very quickly, if you, you don't know anything about Sam Bankman-Fried, very quickly you will get the sensation, despite everything that, that Lewis is doing in this book, that the guy is just a gibbering sociopath. 
a slimy, manipulative, opportunistic, predatory, gibbering sociopath. This is not a condemnation of Sam Bankman Freed. It's not a condemnation of any of the crappy, crappy things that he did with his eyes wide open. Uh, so in that sense, also, this is, uh, this is Michael Lewis being caught in the web of bro finance. Michael Lewis perhaps put capital into bro finance. He is certainly as much a fraud as his subject for soap selling him to the public here when that is not his job. Uh, as a writer, he's looking at all the primary information that you don't have access to. You're supposed to be able to trust him to tell you what that looks like and feels like, and he's not. Instead, he's this is an elaborate job application. Uh, and it's going to be on your display. So <laughs> just in case, just in case you're pressed for time, I thought I would give you one nonfiction recommendation that covers all the bases for the uh, uh, for the prompts. But I have other recommendations as well. So we'll go through we'll go through a list of those right now. Uh, I'll try not to make this a very long video, <laughs> though you know what I like get when I talk when I recommend books. So the first one we'll do is Neil Gabler. I've mentioned this book before, not this particular book, but its prequel. He is doing a a massive two volume, highly detailed. Uh, first serious biography of Senator Ed Kennedy. Ted Kennedy was the, the younger brother of RFK and JFK, and he was in the Senate forever and ever. Uh, and Gable decided to do a, a full-dress biography of him, to talk to everybody that he knew, research, all sorts of things. He did uh, one volume, which is I think was called Catching the Fire, or Catching the Wind. And in November comes his second volume, Against the Wind, Catching the Wind was about a young Ted Kennedy. This is about Ted Kennedy, the so-called Lion of the Senate, and is, in my opinion, far more rich material for a biographer to play with. I mean, Ted Kennedy was, uh, as a young man, was handsome, uh, a screw-up, feckless, somewhat dumb, and also, depending on what you believe about the incident at Chappaquiddick, deeply criminal, maybe even homicidal. Uh, but that's none of that is the reason why he's remembered, and it's not all ultimately that interesting. Whereas him affecting the political landscape of his day for so long, half a century, is very much interesting. So if you're interested in uh, political biography, some of you will be old enough to remember Ted Kennedy. Uh, that might be a choice. Uh, also, something we've seen on this channel. This is by Martin Whitock. This is American Vikings, where the author investigates the claims that Vikings made their way to the New World centuries before any Elizabethan or Jacobin explorers did, uh, and may have encountered may have uh, encountered natives and also chronicled some of this in their sagas. Uh, so you, you Viking fanatics out there, you might want to put that on your list, get that from your library or bookstore for November. And then we'll, next we'll deal with another kind of fanatic. <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> uh, this book has been long rumored, it's been long promised, one might even say long threatened, and it's also just plain long. <laughs> this is My Name is Barbara, by, in heavy, heavy air quotes, Barbara Stuyzen. This is the book that fans of hers have been wanting her to write for 50 years. This is that book. It's like 5,000 pages long. It will include every single little emotional breakdown, every single little backstage bit of cattery, at every single sh show and song. Uh, well, <laughs> if d d not, these are recommendations in a way, if Barbara Streisand is your thing, well, this is the book you've been waiting for. This is, you know, it. it I, I want to be as cautious here as I am with uh, a couple of other celebrity memoirs that are out now or coming out soon. I want to be cautious with uh, their name on the cover, as as we often see. If if the name on the cover is not accompanied on the cover by the the person who actually wrote the book, then in the acknowledgments there will be something like "Who gave my ramblings a voice" or "Who gave voice to my memories" or something like that, and that is largely code speak. And I am not trying to be dismissive here. I am saying that if you spend the whole of your career honing your skills and working ten hours a day at different projects in order to become the incredible singer and entertainer that Barbara Streisand was, or in order to become the incredible actor that Patrick Stewart was, it is unreasonable to expect that at the same time that you were doing all of that, you were also honing your abilities as a writer. And I don't mean just word choice here. I mean 
the ability to sit at your desk for three hours a day in order to get a manuscript done. I think, in a way, I won't, I'm not trying to get on my high horse here, but I think, in a way, it's a little bit insulting to people who do write to imply, as this always does imply, that writing a book is something that we could all do if we just had the spare time. This doesn't involve any skills of its own. That always bothers me. It actually includes, it actually involves a huge number of skills on its own, and it takes an equal amount of time to get good at those skills as it does to get good at singing uh, on Broadway or acting on the bridge of the Enterprise. To say that you dev devoted a lifetime of skills to the latter but that you, all along you could just easily do this other thing is to say that there's no skill involved in writing. When actually there is, and the reality of that, the proof in the pudding, is that there will be someone who wrote this. Almost always, in almost all cases, there will be someone who actually did the writing, who actually was at their desk for three hours a day. They might be filled with anecdotes and enthusiasm from whoever, but they're the ones doing the writing. That, so it, it grates me a little that there's no other name on this cover, but you know what you're getting with this book. Uh, and it's going to do well in November. To put it mildly, it's going to do very well. Uh, and then we'll move on to uh, history. This touches on Vikings again just a bit. This is Don Hallway. This is his book, Battle for the Island Kingdom. He wrote The Last Viking, which is a really good book. Uh, and this is his book about the fateful generation before 1066, before the invasion from of William the Conqueror. This is about an, an England in turmoil, and with lots of claimants looking at it. A, a rich, uh, wealthy island. A whole bunch of claimants, not just in England, wanting that crown, but all around it, thinking, how easy would it be to sail a few longships in and take the whole thing? Uh, it's, a, it's a fascinating period. I think far more fascinating than, for instance, the 60 years that follows 1066. And here we have a new book on it that's coming out in November. Uh, then we have a terrific book. Uh, this is by Judith Tick. This is Becoming Ella Fitzgerald. A new biography about... that. It, it, it In a way, it's like the Ted Kennedy book, because it, although you get the whole shape of Ella Fitzgerald's life here, it's mainly about uh, before she was Ella Fitzgerald, so to speak, when when the thing that was wowing people, the thing that was staggering them, was the size of the talent here. And then only only in the background there, the the uh, the flinty dignity of the woman herself, and also a fair amount of business acumen. This is uh, an amazing story. Absolutely amazing. I already knew, when I saw this, this thing being touted by publishers, I already knew that it was an amazing story, and worried only that Judith Tick would not see how amazing it was. And I need not have worried about this. This is... This is absolutely terrific. I hope it does really well in November. Uh, then we have something by Dayton Duncan and Ken Burns. Uh, this is for you natural history fans, you nature lovers, but you're going to know already this is not going to be an easy book to read at all. So if, I mean, that's the thing we have to face for nonfiction November, right? Quite a, quite a bit of nonfiction November is not at all in the business of they, had, they lived happily ever after. Quite a bit of nonfiction is brutal to read. This is a brutal story. This is called Blood Memory, and it is about the American buffalo, the American bison. Uh, so there are some boutique sort of museum Fremen herds of buffalo that are, exist in America now. Uh, but once upon a time, <laughs> there were herds that blanketed gigantic counties of land. Once upon a time, you would feel thunder in the ground days before the herd reached where you were. And if you had an encampment up on a hill overlooking a plain, a savannah of grass and, you know, water-fed wallies and whatnot, and you had an encampment up on a plain, up on that escarpment, the rock that you were camping on, that rock would be shaking for days with you thinking it's an earthquake and not seeing anything around. Then you would start to see the first bulls and the first of a herd. And if you stood on that rock and promontory, the whole of that next day, a herd of buffalo would be passing by underneath you. All day long. And then you would go to sleep at night, and you would wake up the next morning, and it would still be passing by. That same herd, that would be three days 
for it, to, it took to, for that herd to pass you by. And that herd would have a lot of satellite attention. There'd be a number of First Nation people who would be harrying the, the ends and the peripheries of that herd, picking off stragglers that could make their whole winter of food. They'd be also haunted by wolves that whole time and coyotes that whole time. But barely anything, barely picking off a fraction of a percent of the whole thing. Uh, and this book, a large part of this book, will tell of the absolute destruction of those giant herds. And it's a bloody, horrible, merciless, and thoughtless thing. It's a, it's a hard reading. This, the, the subtitle here talks about the, uh, the tragic decline and the improbable resurrection. So probably the authors here, especially if this is the Ken Burns, will be going for a happy ending at the end. A bit, anyway. A glimmer of hope. That at least this species, unlike the passenger pigeon, was not completely extinguished. So, it might not be just, you know, a, a, a grim thing all along. Then we have Andrew Pedigree. I, I really like this author. He writes about books. And this is his new one, The Book at War, How Reading Shaped Conflict and Conflict-Shaped Reading. So this will be, some of you may remember, When Books Went to War, a book from a few years ago, about books in one particular war. This strikes me as it'll be a more global thing. What what effect has literacy had? What What efforts were made by governments in the... First World War, the Boer War, the Second World War, the Vietnam War, to get books into the hands of GIs. And why? And what did it do to them? This strikes me as that it'll be a little more global than that, but I, I, I should recommend here that this author is worth reading about books. Uh, any book of his is worth reading about books. Then we have a biography. This is Benjamin Taylor's book, Chasing Bright Medusas, A Life of Willa Cather, the number one heretical opinion. Uh, among some people, will be that Willa Cather's life is far more interesting than any of her novels. <laughs> uh, certainly, there is a, there was a collection of Willa Cather's letters from a few years ago, ten years ago, that was that brilliantly illustrated just how interesting that life was. And I'm, you can only hope uh, that this biography does the job. Again, I haven't read it, but you can hope that this biographer gets how interesting this figure was how wry and self-observing this figure was. You have to hope, right, that with any with any of the biographies that are on this list, you have to hope that the author gets that. That's the bit of exploration that comes with new releases. Uh, then we have Kelly and Zach Wienersmith. I think I've shown you this book before. This is A City on Mars. Their study of uh, what could be done to build a human habitation on Mars. Typically speaking, if you, for instance, I've never tried this, but if you were to go to Google Image, and type in cities on Mars, you would see this part. You would see dome, cities under domes on the surface of Mars. But that's not the way to do it. They would be underground. Uh, I, think, I think maybe the UK edition of this book has cities under domes on the surface of Mars. But that's not probably the route that would be taken. Instead, you would be underground to protect you from the lethal curtains of radiation that sweep all over the surface of Mars on a constant basis. Uh, Mars is a weird failed twin of Earth. It has a, a lot less mass, and it has, through a series of unfortunate events, it has lost its atmosphere, most of its atmosphere and all of its surface water. So if you were going to build a habitation on Mars, which is uh, a dream, of course, uh, especially of old NASA fans, you have to figure out how to do it. What are the practicalities? And that's what this book does. One of the things that this book does a little more forcefully than I think probably the authors expected uh, is to throw a spotlight on living on Earth as the surface of the, the global climate of Earth changes. Uh, 2023, the summer of 2023, broke heat records flagrantly all over the world and not by a fraction of percent, sometimes by two, three, four, five percent. So no one's going to come close to breaking those records under normal circumstances ever again until next summer when the abnormal circumstances that are breaking those records continues to break them. So now you are looking at a world without any surface water. Now you are looking at a world that, although it's protected by a magnetosphere, is still ruthlessly inhospitable to biological life on its surface or in its oceans. So you'll start to think about that when you're looking at this. What what When you're building a city on Mars, you're hedging, you're mitigating against catastrophic external environmental factors. And you'll start to think as you read this book how many of those you're starting to hear about in the daily news on Earth, on this, on this blue dot. Uh, then we have another, another piece of natural history. 
This one isn't quite so painful as the buffalo one. This is a uh, devilfish. And this is a, a history of folklore as much as it is the, the giant squid, Architeuthis. This is, this is a history of lore, legend, spottings, uh, reliable first-hand accounts of giant squid in the North Atlantic in the hundred years before they were reliably identified, found by science, and photographed. And that's going to make for some fascinating storytelling. Obviously, you know, if you've read, you know, the pot boilers of the Victorian era or 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, then if, if you've read the pot boiler stuff, then you know that they're full of stories of monstrous, marauding, human intelligent giant squid. Uh, and this is kind of, it's meant to commemorate that, but also to ballast it with, you know, reliable accounts. What, what, what did people actually see? What actually showed up? at seaside markets and port cities. What what things that can be relied upon? Really interesting stuff. Uh, most of us, myself included, have never seen a giant squid. So uh, it becomes all the more interesting when you when you go back in time to a period in which even the people who saw it couldn't convince people that they really did. And we have another piece of natural history. This is a little maddening. Uh, this is by Rebecca Renner. This is called Gator Country, uh, in which the author goes to Florida to study the florida alligator population and also to study the florida alligator poaching situation and uh, i probably happened sometime after she got there and around page 30 in this book is when you start to notice stockholm syndrome set in uh, a large part of this book way too much of this book is dedicated to defending poachers to saying well you know they, they're just trying to put meat on the table or whatnot uh you know this or it's a treasured way of life or something like that uh I almost want to hand every person that she's uh, corruptly defending a copy of that Buffalo book, <laughs> you know, but uh, because there isn't any reason to poach alligators except opportunism. It, it's illegal for a reason. Uh, but this also has a heaping helping of fascinating natural history about the alligator in Florida. And there, unlike the giant squid, that is something that some of you may have actually seen. I have seen my share of them. I, I've been close and personal with some Florida alligators and uh, it's not a pleasant experience but it is fascinating. So uh, if you for instance live in Florida <laughs> and then you might want to uh, you might want to add this to your your uh, library's request list. Uh, oh god <laughs> okay and we have a book by Bruce McCallum. Uh More Natural History. This is Grizzly Bear Science. Uh, and the subtitle is And the Art of a Wilderness Life. This is a person who goes into the, the Flathead Valley and deals with grizzly bears. And uh, This season had a bear book like this, What the Bears Know, uh, that was about the American black bear and was a little bit disappointing. It was a little bit glib. I don't know what this one will be like. Uh, dealing with American black bears is significantly different from dealing with American grizzly bears. American black bears are much, much smaller on average and tend to be far more timid. Generally speaking, if you encounter a black bear on a trail or in, you know, in a suburban parking lot or something like that, if you even so much as move towards it, it will turn and run. Grizzly bears are built like uh, Honda Civics and they're always in a bad mood and they don't turn and run. Usually they don't. They can, you can count on them to be indifferent. They won't show cowardice, but you can count on them to be indifferent. Except when you can't, <laughs> in which case grizzly bear science redounds to simply you screaming while they rip off huge parts of the body that used to be their own and is now their lunch. Uh, so I'm hoping that this book is full of great natural history about the grizzly bear because their, their natural history is fascinating. We'll see. And also, I mean, if this guy has firsthand anecdotes about going into grizzly country, I've been in grizzly country far more often than I've been in gator country. And if this guy has stories, I'm sure they will be interesting. So I'm just hoping that unlike what the bears know, it isn't all about him. Uh, and then we have a book we've seen on this channel. This is David Runciman. This is The Handover, How We Gave Control of Our Lives to Corporations, States, and AIs. And the large part of this book is a dissection of the extent to which that's true. The extent to which your day-to-day -day life is ruled by corporations and increasingly by AI. Is it an AI who's determining your insurance rates on that new car you bought? Is it an AI that's dictating your treatment regimen at the hospital? It very well could be. 
Uh, and this book examines a lot of that. I, I, there was an element running through here that the author doesn't hit it very hard, so I won't hit it very hard. That kind of bothers me. You can see it reflected in the title. We did not do this. This was done to us, is the point that I, I think you'll want to be making when you read this book. At a couple of points in this book, you'll want to be raising your hand and saying, um, I didn't agree to any of this. <laughs> I, I know that it's bad. I didn't know it was as bad as you're describing it, but I knew already that it was bad, and I didn't want it to be true. <laughs> but I mean, we did not give control over our lives to corporations, right? Corporations used good old-fashioned bribery to make your lawmakers enact Citizens United, which says that corporations are people, even though everyone in the entire country knows they aren't. <laughs> they aren't. A corporation can't adopt a baby. A, can't, a corporation can't buy a house and live in it. A corporation is a collection of people. It's a business, not a person. It's obviously, Citizens United is fraudulent, and it's fraudulent. The reason that it can be obviously fraudulent and still be the law of the land is because it was bought that way. You didn't have any say in that, and neither did I. But the dissection of the extent of the problem is fascinating in this book. Uh, you definitely, definitely worth your time to read. <laughs> then uh, this is this is one of the oddest and most charming nonfiction works coming out in November. I. <laughs> Uh, she's been stealing the show in every video that I've been making. I don't know why. She used to do this as a puppy, but she hasn't done this in a long time where she's just stealing the show. <laughs> What's the matter, baby? What are you doing? Huh? What are you doing? Oh, you're so puppy. You're so I, I read the advanced copy of this thing, and then I read the finished copy uh, that I think I opened off camera. I really can't recommend it strongly enough. I don't know exactly how big an, a potential audience it's going to have, uh, but I, I guess I have to hold it now in a way that won't block the bean if she's going to be in the video. This is Fushichia Dunlop. This is her book, Invitation to a Banquet, which is about uh, Chinese food. <laughs> so the story of Chinese food. And I wouldn't have thought... I would have thought maybe you could make a really engaging Harper's article out of this, but not a whole book. And I was enraptured the whole time. Now, part of that is personal, uh, because I spent a long time, and I mean many decades, whenever I was in the country, whenever I wasn't traveling, I spent many decades going to the same Chinese food restaurant. It wasn't really even a restaurant. It didn't have a name. Uh, you would never have known when you walked by it in Chinatown that it was a restaurant at all. And I was the only white person who ever went into it. But I dearly loved it. I went every week, and that's where I read and annotated my periodicals. So I have myself a long personal history with Chinese food, but I bet a lot of you do too. <laughs> this, you will not believe the, the fascinating story that this author makes out of what seems like an unlikely subject. You just won't believe it. Uh, then we have something by Helena Kelly. This is, uh, she wrote Jane Austen, Secret Radical. A biography of Jane Austen that I did not convince me at all, not in the slightest. It was trying to lay out a case for a version of reading Jane Austen's biography, her novels, especially her letters, and it just wasn't there. I just did not see it at all. Uh, maybe I'll need to revisit that in light of her new book. Her new book is The Life and Lies of Charles Dickens. <laughs> Here, baby, I, this needs to be on the other side. You can't just be sitting there staring at people. Here, go, go on over there. There you go. <laughs> Uh, uh, I think I'm losing the light here. Here, let me, oh, this is just turning into a disaster. All because of the bean. Uh, here, let's uh, let's get the lighting right because we're doing this now, so we might as well do it correctly. Uh, here, let's let's uh, fix that, and then we'll go back to where we were. Uh, while I just engage you in snappy patter. I don't know why the bean is acting this way. And I'm not I'm not really blaming her. We're almost done. Anyway, I'm hoping that this will make this a little bit more visible. No, that didn't help at all. Okay. Well, that's too bad. That's a real shame. Well, I'll, I'll tell you about the books anyway. It's, the, it's this lighting. I can't do anything about the lighting. I don't have a ring light. I don't have any artificial lights. And the lighting has been downright strange for the last five days. So this is obviously going to be a, a bit of a controversial take. On Dickens. This is much like Jane Austen, The Secret Radical. This is going to be taking a look at the, the cuddly and well-beloved public facade of Charles Dickens and seeing what lie beneath it. I love reading about Dickens a whole lot more than I love reading Dickens, so I'm up for this anyway, even if it doesn't end up being convincing. Then we have a reprint 
this is a cause for joy. Uh, this is a good reprint season. November alone is a good reprint month. But this is a cause for joy. Uh, the original version of this of this book is in this room. It might even be visible in the background here if the lighting weren't so weird. This is David Attenborough, and this is what I believe is his greatest book, The Life of Birds. I also think, I know this is a little bit on the heretical side, considering how eye-opening Life on Earth is, but I think this is his best series as well. The one that where he seems, his passions seem most personally there. I'm so happy that this has been, it's being reprinted, according to the publisher, somewhat, somewhat vaguely they say that it's also being revised. So maybe Attenborough had a hand in this, maybe this new material in here. I want it anyway, absolutely. I have a copy of Life of Birds uh, in this room, and I, it's the only one of his books that I go back to. Uh, and then we have something we've seen on this channel before. I, it, it's tremendous, but it's tremendously geeky. So you're going to need to be a dyed-in-the-wool book person to really read this thing. And to really love it. If you are a dyed in the wool book person of a certain type, if you like reading about books, this is it's a long book, but it's a feast. This is Christopher de Hamel's book, The Manuscripts Club, about uh, people reading, preserving, copying, annotating manuscripts for the thousand years between the birth of manuscripts and the birth of type, the birth of mass production of books. And naturally, because that's its subject, it has to pick and choose, it has to jump around, but it does a great job of that. This was just tremendous fun uh, as a book. You wouldn't think it, uh, it. Unless you're familiar with nonfiction November, you might not think that a book like that could be fun, but the author keeps it really enjoyable throughout. Uh, and then we have a big fat biography. This, again, will be for geeks of a certain kind. <laughs> this won't be for everybody. This is Jennifer Byrne's new biography of Milton Friedman. The Last Conservative is the, the silly subtitle the book is given. But this is about the economist Milton Friedman, who is always interesting. Whenever he's on the page, he's interesting. And that helps a lot in a book like this, because this isn't a short book. And a lot of it is about monetary theory and economics, and that is not interesting, except for weirdos. <laughs> so so you're, you're really grateful whenever Friedman shows up on the page. Uh, and depending on how much you want to know about him, well, you get it all in this book. <laughs> so uh, then we have something that's coming out from a much smaller publisher. I don't know how widely this will be distributed. It has interest to me. It's coming out in November. It's by Stephen Waller, and it's called A Moving Meditation, Life on a Cape Cod Kettle Pond. I think this is a smaller publisher. Uh, kettle Pond is a, a term for a really deep pond, freshwater pond, that was left behind by the glaciers. Uh, we have a very big, very deep kettle pond uh, not far from where I am right now. And there are plenty of them on the Cape. And so this will be a Cape Cod meditation. I have a whole shelf of those in this room and might be really good. You never know. If you are a Cape person, if you know Cape Cod really well, you might want to make sure that your local library is going to get this. I, again, I think it's not a big publisher, so they might just pass on it unless you bring it to their attention. Uh, then we have Anthony Caldellis. Th this is an author I've been praising on this channel and before this channel. Uh, for his work on the Byzantine era of the Roman Empire, he he is turning out to be the toweringly greatest historian of the Byzantine era of the Roman uh, Empire. And his new book coming out in November is the book I've been waiting for, which is the New Roman Empire, his history of Byzantium. Uh, I love what this author does. I haven't read this book, but I love what this author does with the original sources, the way he thinks about them, the way he extrapolates from the way he writes. I just, I, I've loved his last four or five books on the Byzantine Empire. Can't wait to see him bring that all together into a book that I think is clearly intended to break out to a general audience, as well it should. So, uh, so if you're looking at, you know, straight up history in November, there you go. Uh, then if we go from, uh, History to Paleobiology, we have this thing from, I believe, the folks at Princeton University Press. This is ocean life in the time of the dinosaurs. And there is a mosasaur about to make a meal of a pterosaur. <laughs> it's a fantastic cover. And this is all about the, the monsters that swam in the deep, or the not-so-deep, right? The plenty of the oceans of Earth at the time, the inland ocean here in the United States, weren't all that deep. You could walk for miles without being up to your armpits. Of course, you'd be eaten several times over if you tried that, but still, uh, this won't be anything pioneering. This will be much more, you know, 
syncretizing all earlier research. But every time, I think this is Princeton that does this, and every time they make a volume like this, I consume it. Like candy corn at Halloween. Because this is, these are just, it's just great. You get lots of good new information. You also get tons of great illustrations. There are all sorts of artists who are out there extrapolating from the latest things that scientists think about what these creatures look like. And you get all of that in one place in these books. So, of course, if you're a dinosaur geek or prehistoric, pre-mammal life geek of any kind, definitely you want to sign up for this one. Then we have uh, a work of translation. This is Anka Mulstein, and this is uh, translated by Adriana Hunter. And this is A New Life of the Painter Pissarro. Uh, I'm going to be giving this another try in Finnish copy when I get the Finnish copy, probably in November. I thought I read the advanced copy and thought it was a little slight, a little bit easy. But that could very well be because I don't know Pizarro really well. Maybe you do. So if if painters' lives, I usually enjoy painters' lives quite a bit. I didn't enjoy this one in you know the jump out of your seat, grab the next person you meet type way that I like to enjoy biographies. It was good, but I I thought it was a little bit smooth. Maybe that's Pizarro's life. Maybe he, that's what he was like. I don't really know. Uh, but it's coming out in November if you're a painter or a painter fan. Uh, we, have, uh, we have a book by Philippa Langley. Some of you may know her name. She found the body, the remains of Richard III. She found his skeleton in a car park. After a long, dedicated search where she was pretty sure she knew what she was looking for. She has a new book. <laughs> her new book is on the princes in the tower. Solving history's greatest cold case. The cold case involves the death of the two sons of Edward IV, Richard's brother, who, who uh, went into the Tower of London for their safekeeping and their comfort and maybe a little bit of sanctuary and never emerged from it alive again. And Richard became king. <laughs> and history, for the last 500 years, has blamed Richard for that. He has, History has said, well... One and one, maybe, in this rare, isolated instance, equals two. <laughs> maybe it's possible that this brutal warlord from the north, seeing these two tiny boys as the only obstacle to his being king of England, told a couple of his friends, go and kill them for me. <laughs> maybe he did that. Uh, that has been history's judgment forever and ever. If you, I would submit here that if you are the woman who found Richard's skeleton, uh, it's possible that you want to exonerate him in a book about the princes in the tower. Either way, it's a much vexed and much debated subject. It's a lot of fun to talk about what really happened and how we know it, where you can base your inferences. So if you like that sort of thing, well, then it's not going to bother you that Philippa Langley is probably not an objective observer, right? It certainly doesn't bother me. I've said that many times on this channel. If, as long as the historian is laying out their predispositions, Make your case. Absolutely make your case. If you have a case to make, I want to hear it. Uh, so, whether you're York or Lancaster, I mean, no matter where you sit on the subject, if you're interested in The Princess in the Tower, this is the latest big thing. This might get reviewed in major venues because of her, because of her own CV. And then we have a uh, uh, collection of letters. There are two collections of letters in my list this time around, which I realize now is going along. I'm blaming the bean. Uh, this is edited by Jonathan Eller, and it's called Remembrance, and this is the letters of Ray Bradbury. Uh, you can't really make it out from, from the cover there, but that is Ray Bradbury with his manual typewriter while traveling. He brought his manual typewriter and lots of paper and lots of other stuff with him when he would take a long train ride, a long plane ride. He would He would take his stuff along on trains, and used to brag that sometimes, if the conditions were just right, he could uh, write an entire short story in the time that it took him to get from one stop to the next. Uh, and this is a collection of his letters. I don't recall there, that I've ever read a collection of Ray Bradbury letters. I So I don't know for sure what this will be like. I haven't got an advanced copy of it yet. But I'm guessing... I don't know exactly how I'm parsing that out in my mind, but I'm guessing from his stories that he's probably a very good letter writer. Uh, that there really, there really probably isn't a dull letter in this bunch. We'll see. A lot of that will come down to the editor. Uh, but we'll see. Uh, then we have a uh, work of history. This is a, a Rome of one's own. <laughs> this is by Emma Sothron, and this is about the women of the Roman Empire. I haven't gotten an advanced copy of this yet. I'm hoping that it's not just about, you know, Messalina and whatnot. I'm hoping that it's about... 
We know a lot about women who weren't the wives, the mothers, or the sisters of, of Roman emperors. We know a lot about women like that. It'd be nice if a lot of them made their appearance in these pages. But it's a fascinating little look at the, the uh, it's the Roman Empire, but I guarantee you it won't be the whole empire. It will be 50 years before the assassination of Julius Caesar and about 75 years afterwards. It'll be that 100-year period. I'm pretty sure that 90% of this will be that. I could be wrong. That would be great. <laughs> that would be absolutely great if I were. But, again, if you're a Roman history fan, uh, that's coming out in November. You might want to put it on your list. Then we get back to bookish people at <laughs> the Manuscripts Club. Uh, here we have another book for bookish people of a certain type. I mean, you're all bookish people, but there's some people that really like to get into the incunabula of books. And this is one for them. This is by Charles Scribner III, and this is called Scribner's Five Generations in Publishing. This is his history of the last 150 years of his family running Scribner's, the publishing house. Uh, there have been two other books on the Scribner house that were fairly major. I read them both and really liked them. I also have a long, good history with Scribner's. So I'm up for this. I mean, when you get a book... When you encounter a book that is Scribner's Five Generations in Publishing and it's written by Charles Scribner III, you know that certain expectations about, I want to say truth-telling, but I should just, I should soften that to objectivity, are going to go out the window. <laughs> Obviously, he's talking about, you know, Grampy and Grand Grampy. So it, you have to read it in that way. You have to read it as a family memoir, not so much a history, no matter what he says it is. Again, I could be wrong about that. Sometimes you get a scion of a famous family who decides, I am, I do have a privileged position in terms of accessing original documents, but I want to write an objective history. So this could be that, for all I know. I'm going to read it anyway. Uh, and then we have, uh, uh, we're almost done here, don't, don't worry. Oh, just a few more. We have a comic book story here. This is by Stephanie Williams. This is a visual encyclo encyclopedia called Strange and Unsung All-Stars, of the DC universe. So this is the, the home of Superman and Batman and Wonder Woman. Only these aren't them. <laughs> these are heroes or villains or in-betweens that are decidedly weird uh, in one way or another. And, uh, <laughs> well, <laughs> you could just tell from the cover what you're going to get in some of these things here. Of course, the reason I want this and the reason I want a finished copy of it is for that guy in green and yellow at the top center there. That is Tensil Ken. That is Matter Eater Lad from my beloved Legion of Superheroes. <laughs> Who can eat anything. The people of his planet Bismol evolved so that they could eat anything. They can digest anything. That's why he's eating metal bars there. Uh, Matter Eater Lad is a strange <laughs> Legion of Superheroes member. You look at the Legion re regularly hold their team of superheroes a thousand years in the future, teenagers. And they regularly hold tryouts for people to join the Legion. And we never, we never really get the full story of Matter Eater Lad's tryout. He's just part of the Legion. It's downright strange that he's a member with a totally useless power, whereas people who have very useful powers are not members. They are, they are turned down at their application. But that'll be strange, but there'll be a lot of other strange characters in here as well. So I have, I've read a couple of other books like this, also ran characters, also ran villains and heroes. This will be kind of interesting to read, I'm sure. And then we have a book that I've... Uh, that I've already shown you on this channel. This is by Gary Bass, and this is Judgment at Tokyo. And the echo of Judgment at Nuremberg is intentional. This is about the war, tri the war crimes trials of Japanese defendants in World War II. It's a story that's not as well known as, you know, the German generals and apparatchiks and functionaries being on trial in Nuremberg and elsewhere. But this author makes the case that it's every bit as important. In fact, might be even more important because it did a lot more to determine the shape of Pacific diplomacy. Uh, I haven't read the finished copy here, so I, I can't really weigh in on how successful it is in those claims. But it's an aspect of World War II history that you don't read that much about. So coming out in November, if you're a World War II fan, you definitely want to want to read it, right? To see what the author has to say about it. Then we have, much like uh, the letters of Ray Bradbury, we have a letter collection. And much like the Life of Birds by David Attenborough, we have a revised edition. This is the letters of J.R.R. Tolkien in a new revised and updated edition. So this will have more letters, probably have a new introduction, maybe new editorial stuff in it as well. So even those of you who, like me, have the, the previous collection, you're probably going to want this as well. 
if you're, especially if you're a Tolkien completist, if you're a Tolkien completist, this is, it goes without saying that you have to have this. There's also a couple of other things for Tolkien completists that are coming out that you're just going to have to have. There's a, a study of The Hobbit, for instance, that I think comes out in December that you're definitely going to want. But this, this will not be entirely the old version. There'll be new stuff here. Uh, alone recommends it. Uh, okay. All right, we'll, we'll stop on Tolkien. We'll end with a negative. There are bad books coming out in November, as there are bad books that come out every month. One of the worst books is this, Unwoke, by Senator Ted Cruz, uh, talking about his hatred of all things woke. In an, in a desperate attempt to look over here, look over here, distract you from the fact that he was an active and extremely willing participant in an armed insurrection to overthrow the United States government. He very much does not want that on his resume. He very do much does not want anyone replaying video of him on January 6th urging the crowd to revolt against their government, to revolt against their duly elected representatives. Very much urging the crowd to fight. To, to Very much trying to work them up into a violent mob. The video exists. It's not going anywhere unless unless Trump takes power and bans it. And, and you suffer prison if you show it. Otherwise, it's there on the internet. You could certainly go to a free country and watch it. And Ted Cruz doesn't want you to remember that. Doesn't want you to think about him abandoning his constituents to a freak winter snowstorm where a lot of them would die so that he could fly off to Cancun. Doesn't want you to remember any of that. Instead, he wants you to think that he has, and as is always important to him to say, always has been, a vigilant fighter against the tide of the, the woke mind virus. He didn't even think about it. Until it became popular on Steve Bannon's podcast, he did not even think about it. So that, like everything else, like literally everything else this human being has said in the last 25 years, everything he has said has been a lie. <laughs> An easily provable lie. This is the same thing. In this book, he claims that he has always been a tireless, unsleeping warrior against the woke mind virus. Didn't know about it and didn't care about it even five years ago. Uh, he's been in the Senate for like 70 years, something like that. Doing evil or nothing. Those are the two choices of what he's been doing in the U.S. Senate. Evil or nothing. Uh, but this book is nevertheless coming out in November. <laughs> Maybe you aren't going to read it, <laughs> but uh, there will be people who will. Uh, most of them will be in the Cruz family, but still. <laughs> so I, I thought I'd leaven things out. There's plenty of bad stuff coming out in November. I mean, that Michael Lewis book on Sam Bankman Freed, where we started a million years ago, is coming out in November. Uh, we'll see how bad any of these things are. Some of them I know already. Some of them I can vouch for. But those are those are a, mo a month's worth of recommendations we can do for Nonfiction November in 2023. Those are things that are coming out in November. They are the November releases. So if you want to spring for one of them at your bookstore, there are a handful here where I would actually I would actually say it would be worth the money to do. Or if you want to you know get on a list for them or get your library to get them. If your library has not ordered invitation to a banquet get them to do it. It's really enjoyable. Improbably enjoyable. Same thing with a lot of these other things. Not so sure that I'm going to really like having an author get all cozy and touchy-feely about how misunderstood grizzly bears are. I'm not, not so sure that, I, that, I'm going to, that I'm going to nod just enthusiastically throughout such a book, having encountered them at least as many times as the author has, but nevertheless. I, uh, most of these are the ones that I haven't read I'm really excited about, for one way or another. Not the Ted Cruz book, but plenty of the others. So, some recommendations. Sorry that this went on so long. I will make more recommendations for Nonfiction November. We've got two more weeks for you to get your TBR in order. But I'll wrap this up for now, uh, and I'll be back. Thank you, BookTube.